what? When? Where? Why? How? And who? I have six little friends. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and where and when and why and how and who. Longfellow wrote that, but there's a lot of wisdom in it. When you go through scriptures, if you can answer those six questions, you pretty much have got a pretty good handle or a pretty good hold on the scriptures. And, you know, you just apply these to the rapture of the church. The what we just saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You can also pick up some additional information on what is actually going to happen in 1 Corinthians 15. When? When's it going to happen? It's going to happen before the tribulation period. We don't have to know. Everybody's trying to make predictions. It's going to be on this day or that day. No, none of that matters. The when, the important thing about the when, it's going to happen before the tribulation period. We'll see more of that in our uh, passage ahead of us. And then when we get into 2 Thessalonians tomorrow. Where? Everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. All around the world. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but it's because of the finished and victorious work of Christ and because we are the church. How? Well, we've already seen that. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice, the archangel, the trump of God. Who? We might need to answer that one. Who's going to go? Is it all believers or only some believers? Scripture tells us we're going to answer it. Join me at the throne of grace and we'll get into it. Once again, our gracious Father, we thank you for the wonderful feast that we just had. We may not have considered the fact that we were sitting down to a meal that most people in the world have never known. They have never eaten as well as we were just able to eat. We thank you for providing it for us. We ask now as we come back to the word that we will have as great an appetite to feast on your word as to feed our physical body. Bless to the nourishment of our soul the truths that we're about to study. Sanctify us for your service to fulfill the plan for which you have brought us into this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The rapture of the church. This is what we've seen so far. Chapter 1. It is a day of deliverance from the coming wrath. Remember that wrath is used there in a technical sense as it's used throughout the Old Testament for the day of the Lord. We're going to see more about that in our class coming up. In chapter 2, we saw that it is a day of eternal reward. Those things that we have done by faith are going to be rewarded. Remember that Jesus said even the smallest act is going to be rewarded. If you give so much as a child a cup of cold water in the name of Christ, you will not lose that reward. That should stir all of us because every one of us can be laying up treasure in heaven. Simple acts of grace and kindness, not just out of human goodness, but out of love for Jesus Christ. Because we love him and because we desire to be a witness for him. It will be a day of eternal reward. The greatest of rewards are called crowns. I didn't go through the five different crowns. If you're interested, we can maybe get into that in the question and answer session. So it's a day of eternal reward. It is a day of completed holiness. We were made a saint the day that we trusted Christ as our Savior. We are now in the process of being sanctified. And as I said, this should be our concern. The, the focus that we have on the most important day, which is when? Today. 
Am I making progress today? Am I really growing in grace and becoming more like Jesus Christ every day? It's a day of completed holiness, and that will be a marvelous day. It's going to be fourth a day of resurrection and reunion. A day of resurrection and reunion. And we just saw that in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And now we are going to see it is the first day of our eternal life with Jesus Christ. The first day of our eternal life. We have eternal life now but it'll be the first day of our eternal life in His presence, seeing Him face to face. You say, well, what about the people who have died? Well, they're incomplete. Absent from the body is face to face with the Lord, but they're lacking something. Their resurrection is not complete until that resurrected, glorified body. So they're still in anticipation even as we are. So that brings us up to chapter 5, and um, you know, First and Second Thessalonians to teach two books of Scripture in a weekend. When we were leaving our church, someone asked me what we were going to be doing. We told them we'd be gone for three weeks. I said, I've got 23 classes to teach in less than three weeks. Just think about that for a while. If you've ever prepared a Bible class, 23 classes in less than 21 days. It takes a lot of work. It takes blood, sweat, and tears. And Nan can tell you that about a week ago, I was in a funk because I felt like there was no way that I could be ready. But here we are. Of course, I'm still working on the next conference coming up next weekend. I'm still working on. So it's, it's still a work in progress. But I believe we will get there. All right, if you will join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to look at looking and living for the right day. We want to make sure that we're looking for the right day. And this brings us back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 and verse 37. They had a day that they were to be looking for. If you're looking for the wrong day, your preparation is going to be the wrong preparation. The day that we're looking for is different than theirs but we need to be sure that it's the right one. So I'm just going to start off here in the first, well, really the first 11 verses are a unit. Uh, let me read it and I'll comment as we go along. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Now, you might remember that in Acts chapter 1, the disciples asked the Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Do you remember what he said? I think it's Acts 1, 7 and 8. He said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons. It is not for you to know. Here, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, and he says to these people who had only been believers a short time, concerning the times and the seasons, you don't even need me to write to you, because you know full well. So this shows us that you have to be careful what Scripture is talking about, because someone could camp out on Acts 1, 7, and 8 and say, well, there's no way we can know. Well, this passage says that we should know. When he talks about the times and the seasons, what's he actually talking about? He uses two words, and I've switched to this permanent marker. I hate to use up these sheets, but the other markers just aren't very clear. So, times and season, times. Chronos. Look like anything you know? Chronology. It means time in succession. It means periods of time following one another. And then we have seasons. And the word is kairos. And that means a designated period of time. 
We connect these in what we refer to as dispensations. So when we look at human history, we start here in eternity past. We run through eternity future. The cross is in the center. It divides between the two major portions of history, Old Testament and New Testament or Old Covenant, New Covenant dispensations. And then we can break those down in the Old Covenant dispensation. We have Genesis 1 through 10, which is the age of the Gentiles. From Genesis 11 onward, Abraham, we're dealing with the age of Israel. With the coming of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes down and we begin the church age. The church age is unique in all of human history. No other believer is referred to as being in Christ. No other believer is permanently and eternally indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Only the church age believer. After the rapture of the church, which we just talked about in our last session, we have a brief period of time, big T for tribulation, and after that we go into the thousand-year reign of Christ the kingdom. So here we have times, and here we have a season. That makes sense to everyone? Again, the early apostles did not understand this because it had not yet been revealed. You'll remember Jesus in the upper room said, I have many more things to say to you, but you're not ready to receive them yet. You will be ready later, and that's they were ready when they received the Holy Spirit, and God began to give the majority of New Testament revelation to the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, primarily and predominantly Apostle to the Gentile church. And so he has pretty much laid things out for us and made it clear. So, coming back to verse 1, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, let's break time down a little bigger. Let's put the rapture of the church here. Now we're in tribulation. That is the day of the Lord. Uh, actually, the day of the Lord in its broadest sense includes not only the tribulation, but the kingdom age. That whole 107 year period is referred to as the day of the Lord. But predominantly when we talk about the day of the Lord, we're speaking of the judgment surrounding or coming up to the second coming of Christ to the earth. Here we meet him in the air. Here he's coming to the earth. Here he comes in the day of Christ for blessing. Here on the day of the Lord, he is coming for judgment. Now it will be, of course, a day of deliverance for those believers living on the earth at that time. But predominantly we're looking at judgment. So you yourselves know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Why would it come as a thief in the night? See, we're, we're talking what, when, where, why, why. I would suggest to you that the why is because when a thief in the night comes, are you expecting him? Uh, do, were you able to prepare for him? Does he take you by surprise? All of those things are true. And the reason for that is because of the rapture of the church. When the rapture of the church takes place, there will be such a radical shift, not just visibly in the people who are here and the world powers that are uh, being affected by it, and the fact that all believers have been taken out of the world, but the biggest factor is the restrainer. We haven't talked about him. He's coming up in 2 Thessalonians 2 tomorrow. He is going to be removed. 
as bad as it is right now, and this gives you another reason why the rapture must take place, because as long as the church is here and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, that is God's greatest restraining power against evil. Can you imagine as bad as it is today how bad it'll be once that restraint is gone? Just imagine if those who have satanic, diabolical, de de demon-possessed mentalities were free to do anything they wanted. Well, that day is going to come. It's going to come when all restraint is removed from the earth. So the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. He's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about the tribulation. I said earlier when people say the Lord's coming as a thief in the night, not for me. You may have wondered why I said that. This passage will tell us. For when they say, and I want you to notice the distinction here, he talks about we and us, and he talks about they and them. Now, you have to be careful with this because not every passage is making a distinction when you see we, us, or they, them. Not every passage is making a distinction between believer and unbeliever. Hebrews, for example, is an example where it talks about believers who are faithful versus believers that fall away, and it uses the same language. We are not like them. In the passage where he says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Some believers were forsaking the local assembly, so he draws a distinction between we are not like them. In other words, we're not going to do what they have done. And I just point that out to you because it's very easy for us to fall into automatically always wanting to interpret things the same way in every passage, and you have to be careful of that. You can't always lay down an ironclad rule that when you see words like this, they mean certain things, okay? You have to distinguish in the context who is being spoken of. When they say peace and safety, do you think if someone showed up on the world today and was able to put an end to all the things that are terrifying people, all the things that people are afraid of, have a solution for every problem? Do you think people would be saying, finally, peace and safety? Of course they would. And that's exactly what's going to happen. But when they say peace and safety, then, here's the thief in the night, sudden destruction comes on them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. No unbeliever will escape the tribulation period. We are so close to this, I believe we're in spitting distance. But you know what I know? Think of the, what do we have, 8 billion people, 7 billion people on the planet right now? Think about it in these terms. There's two ways we can think about it. From the time of Jesus Christ until today, talking 2,000 years of human history, over half the population that has lived since the time of Christ until today is alive right now. Let that sink in. From the time of Christ until the day you and I are living in, more than half the population that has lived from that time is here now. Now that's good news and it's bad news. The good news is we have the greatest opportunity to reach the world for Christ that any generation has ever had. No generation has ever had the potential to reach that many people. The bad news, those who reject Jesus Christ in that vast multitude of people may be snuffed out within seven and a half years' time. Think about that. If the rapture of the church were to come within the next two or three months, you've got seven years and the population of the earth goes almost to zero. 
with the exception of believers living at the time of the second coming. But you, brethren, notice verse 4, here's the contrast. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as a thief. Can you see why I say that day is not going to overtake me as a thief? We're not in the darkness. Who is it going to overtake? The children of darkness. But what does Paul tell us in Colossians 1 and verse 13? That when we trusted in Jesus Christ, he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. We're no longer in the dark. We're in a completely different realm. He's using light and dark to refer to a spiritual realm. And we are in the realm of light. You, he says in verse 5, are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Are you filling in the who, what, when, where, how, and why? This passage gives us a lot of information. Therefore, verse 6, now it gets interesting. I wish I had uh, Inspector Colombo here to go through this for you. I always enjoyed watching him. He, he would, you know how he investigated? He investigated the way you and I should do our Bible study. You know the best way to do Bible study? Ask questions. He'd always come in, you know, you've seen the movies, and he'd come in, he'd, he'd stand there and he'd look at something. Of course, he always had his cigar, so... And then he grabbed some bystander. You know, there's a, there's a cleaning lady. And he goes, could I ask you a question? She goes, yeah. He says, now why do you think that 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 ought to be sitting on the table is over here? I just can't figure, I've been pondering on this and I just, can, do you have any ideas? And he begins gathering information and everyone thinks he's an idiot and the guy couldn't, you know, find his backside with both hands. And the whole time he's, he's doing one of the greatest tactics of strategy ever. And that is never let your enemy overestimate you. Always make your enemy underestimate you. He always does it. And he just gathers information. He's gone who, what, when, where, why, how. And when he has enough information, he'll, he, oh, I just have one more question. Right? I love the guy. So that's what we're doing here. Therefore, verse 6 says, let us not sleep. Now, I've been pondering this. And I have a problem. Didn't we just read in 1 Thessalonians 4 about those who are asleep in Christ? And he told us that those who are asleep in Christ, he'll bring with him when he comes. And when they come with him, the body, which is sleeping in the grave, is going to meet the spirit, which is face to face with the Lord. And we are not to grieve because the Lord has it all under control. So I just have one question. How can he command us not to sleep? Because if sleep is death, how much control do you have over it? You don't have any control over it. And so therefore, some people who are scholars would say, well, here we are in the same context and we have the word sleep and therefore it has to be interpreted the same in chapter 5 as chapter 4. But I have a problem. I can only do Colombo to a certain extent. Do you remember that I told you in chapter 4 that the word sleep was... I have trouble. I start writing in English and then I revert to Greek. Koimaomai. Remember? Here in chapter 5, let 
The word is kathudo. Now, why would Paul change his word? The reason he changes his word is because he's talking about something entirely different. Whereas koimaomai is a good word for sleep, kathudo is a bad word. Is a bad word for sleep. Because this word for sleep doesn't mean taking peaceful, natural rest. This word means to be out of it. You are sleepwalking through life. You are spiritually out of it. You don't know what's going on around you. We use the term, you're living in a dream world. Well, what does that suggest? That suggests you're asleep. You might remember Paul uses the idea in Ephesians 5 and verse 14, wherefore he says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. What's he talking about? He's talking about a believer who is unconscious. They're going through life unaware of what's happening in the spiritual realm around them. So let us not sleep. Don't be unconscious in your spiritual life as others do. Those others are believers oftentimes. But let us watch and be sober because those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. He's now paralleling this idea of sleep with the idea of being drunk. And when you're drunk, you are disconnected from reality. Okay? Verse 8, but let us, we who are of the day, be sober putting on the breastplate of, you ready for it? Faith and love and the helmet of hope. Faith, hope, and love. Keeps coming back over and over. It runs all through Paul's epistles. You know, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I had to milk cows. And when we milk cows, you would sit down on a milking stool. And this milking stool was basically just a flat board or whatever, a seat with a stick under it. Maybe about yay long. And you just stick it down on the ground and, you know, you could kind of rock around with a cow. But have you ever seen a cow cow kick? Well, a cow kick is when they're standing there and they bring it up and kick to the side like this. And so you're happily milking away and all of a sudden that cow-cow kicks you and you go rolling away. And part of the reason you go rolling away is because you have a stool with one point of contact. If you have a stool with two points of contact, it's a little bit better, but it's, now it's, it's not every which way, it's just forward and back, right? If you want to have a stable stool, what is the minimum number of legs you have to have? Three. Some of you flunked that test. <laughs> the minimum number of legs. I mean, you can have ten if you want. But three will do. If you have three points, rock climbers, mountain climbers, understand when you're climbing a mountain, unless you're one of those crazy people that does it without any support and they'll hang by their fingertips but a lot of them die you want three points of contact you want two feet and a hand while you're moving this leg to step up you want two hands and a foot because that's the least number point of contact to have any stability okay in your spiritual life the three stool legs that you need to sit on, faith, hope, and love. It's kind of like when Nan and I hike through the jungles of New Guinea, and it's extremely steep, and it's extremely perilous, and I always walk with a staff. You know why I always walk with a staff? Because I can always have three points of contact. 
I can be a hold. I mean, we've gone places there. There's one place in New Guinea we call a staircase. Imagine going up the side of a mountain like this, and the trail is about this wide, maybe a foot wide, and it runs like this. And Nan will be ahead of me, and her feet are by my head, and they're about this far away. It's that steep. It takes three hours to get from the bottom of that mountain to the top of it, and that's only one mountain range in five that we have to get over to get to the village that we're going to. Steep, steep country. You know what? I have found it extremely helpful to have a hiking staff. Nan doesn't like them. She says they hinder her mobility, but I've seen her flying a few times, so <laughs> she's seen me flying a few times as well. Faith, hope, and love. Verse 9, 4. Whenever you see the little word for, always remember that it's explanatory of what's just been said. For God did not appoint us to wrath. What wrath is he talking about? Same wrath in chapter 1, verse 10. Same wrath he's talking about as the sudden destruction in verse 3. God has not appointed us to go through the tribulation period. Why would that help us to put on the breastplate and the helmet of faith, hope, and love? Because doesn't that give you some assurance, some confidence, some stability in the instability of the world in which you live? Absolutely. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. You know what the word salvation is here? Go back to chapter 1 and verse 10, and it says He delivers us. Same word. He delivers us from the wrath to come. Whenever salvation occurs in Scripture, ask the question, save from what? Because too many people see the word salvation and they instantly think eternal salvation. You want to know a passage that's really important here? Matthew 24, verse 12 or 13. He who endures to the end will be saved. Well, if you take that as eternal salvation, you've just made salvation a result of your works. If you endure long enough, if you hang on hard enough, if you serve really well, if you're really faithful, you will be saved. You know what that says? Most of us are going to hell. People don't think of the ramifications of their interpretation. What Jesus is saying in that passage, because if you'll remember Matthew 24 and 25, is all about the tribulation period. And he's saying, if you can survive through the tribulation, you're going to be delivered. Christ is going to come back to earth. And you'll go into the kingdom. It's not talking about eternal salvation. So here we have... Salvation from the day of wrath through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another as you also are doing. Question. Christ died for us so whether we wake or sleep. Who are the ones that are awake? A lot going on there. Those who are awake are the ones who are spiritually mature. I, I would say sp spiritual and growing. Okay. Let's let's just say spiritual and growing. Good point because the next one, who are those who are asleep? Who are those who are asleep? We could say spiritual versus carnal, right? Because we just identified up in verse six that sleep is not referring to death. It's referring to being spiritually out of it. We would say carnal. Don't be carnal, be spiritual. Now, if someone comes along teaching that when the rapture occurs, only the spiritual believers are going to go, where would you take them to prove that's wrong? Right here. This yes. passage solves the whole problem. Oh. 
I've just, so I just that, wondered if you're talking in video awake, is causing is us not to receive the focused, basic training post. I see he's back on there now. Okay, go I'm going to dis- I'm going to mute myself. You know fits with 1 John 2:28 says when he appears I guess I'll we can either it. stand right. in his presence in confidence or ashamed. When Christ comes, if I'm asleep, if I'm out of it, do you think I'm going to be ashamed? I think so. Does that mean he's going to leave me behind? No. You know why? Because we may be unfaithful. He is not. He is faithful regardless of whether we take advantage of our spiritual opportunities or not. So we have two different days. Day of Christ, day of the Lord. We have two different people, those who are children of wrath and those who are children of Christ, children of God. But among the children of God, we also have another division, two more sets of people, those who are spiritually motivated and those who are carnal. And folks, I would not push this down to the point where you're driving down the road and you don't know that it's the day of the rapture. And as you're driving along and some guy drives by and cuts you off and you lose it for a minute, which we've all done, and you're going, I'd like to run that guy off the road. Bang, the rapture takes place. And you're going, oh man, I failed. I think it's the trend of our life. It's what I was trying to get at in our last session. How will we know if we are being perfected in holiness? As I said, to stand blameless before him in holiness, no believer is going to be without sin. So how could anybody do that? I think it's the trend of their life. I think it's the tendency of their life that's going to make the difference. Not that split second moment where everything is going to be decided by a moment. Can I look back in my life and see that I am making progress? Can I see that I am growing? Can others see that I'm making progress and growing in my faith? That my character is changing? That my way of dealing with other people is changing? If they can... I think that's cause for confidence. But you know what? We always have that little caveat, excel still more. Keep on keeping on. Keep pressing for higher ground. No matter how far we've come, it's never a time to sit back and rest on our laurels. So we are walking and looking for that right day. And then he goes on in verse 12 and 22, and I'm going to hit the last part of this really fast, even though our very last section is chock full. We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you. I'm in verse 12, in the Lord, and admonish you, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. What he's saying here is that we're to recognize people who are a benefit, a blessing, people who contribute to our spiritual life, pastors, teachers, fellow believers, everyone that contributes to us, we should be thankful for them and recognizing what they mean in our life. Now, he says in verse 14, we exhort you, brethren, and warn those who are unruly. Who are the unruly? They're the ones that are asleep. They're the same ones we saw in verse 6. They're not living a faithful lifestyle. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. You ready for this? How do you want to turn your life around if you feel like maybe your spiritual life is not all that it should be? Here's three things. Three legs for your stool. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. Do you realize what a transformation it would make in your life and mine if we took those three things. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, takes the issue of sanctification, the idea of spiritual growth and spirituality, and he reduces it down to its utmost simplicity in something every single one of us can do. You want to change your life? Who do you know that's faint-hearted that you could comfort? 
Who do you know that's weak that you can hold up? Who do you know that is a trial to be around that you could be patient with? There you have it. It would make a huge difference in our life. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Uh, I think I mentioned it in your notes. I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail here, but between verse 12 and verse 23, there are 16 commands. This is one of the most heavily chalked passages of Scripture with commands of things that we are to do. And I'm going to run through them really quick here. Verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but pursue what is good for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. A whole bunch of commands, but there are two commands in the middle of it that are the key to it all. And I want you to get those two commands. In verse 19, it says, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. There are four commands regarding the Holy Spirit. Four commands regarding the Holy Spirit. We are commanded to be filled. Ephesians 5.18 Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. I prefer to translate that, be filled by means of the Spirit. In other words, let the Spirit of God fill you with His fruit. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16. If I am filled with the Spirit, I am to go out there and walk in the Spirit. I have to be filled before I can walk, right? Be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Three, grieve not the Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30. You say, what grieves the Holy Spirit? Sins of commission. If you look in the context of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, you will find that what grieves the Holy Spirit is sin in our life. Things that we are doing, thinking, or saying. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Then in our passage, quench not the Spirit. What's the difference between grieving and quenching? Sins of omission. There are two M's in omission. Just add one. Sins of omission. How do we know that? Because when we look at the context, what do we see surrounding this command not to quench the spirit? A whole bunch of things we're supposed to do. If you don't do them, you're quenching the spirit. The word to quench literally means to put out a fire. What is the easiest way? I'm going to give you another test here. Here's a big one for all you outdoors people. What is the easiest way? Now think carefully on this. This is a tough question. Tough test. What is the easiest way to put out a fire? Pour water on it. You know what? That's a lot of work. Just don't give it any fuel. You don't have to do it. You, you can sit there and just watch it die. If you're going to pour water on it, you got to go get a bucket and go to the creek and get water and pour. No, no, forget all that. Just don't give it fuel. 
You know what is fuel for the Holy Spirit in your life? Obedience. Obedience is fuel for the fire of the Holy Spirit in our life. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Feed it and let it burn. And how am I going to not quench the Holy Spirit? Well, the next command that's really important is in verse 20. Do not despise prophecies, and it would be better translated, do not despise prophetic utterance. It's referring not so much to future prophecies as the prophetic word. Do not despise the prophetic word. If I want to keep the fire burning in my life, in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have to be obedient to the positive commands, not the negative commands, don't do this and don't do that, but the ones that say, do this, do this, do this, like the 16 to 18 we have in this context, how am I going to do that? I have to know the word. I have to know the word. God's word tells us what we ought to do. I think all of you can see this conference is different than almost every other conference I've done. And the reason it's different is because it is very non-technical and I am very, very simply in a way that grade school kids could understand going through texts of scripture and bringing things out that maybe you hadn't seen, maybe you missed over, maybe making some distinctions in areas like sleeping and sleeping. It's very, very simple, but it's powerful. And it's powerful because it's challenging us to make our lives what they ought to be here at the end of the church age. Our time is almost up. Christ is near. I forgot to bring your little, what time we got? Huh? I have 10 minutes. You know how Paul closes? He closes with a benediction. Look at verse 23 to 25. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord. I want to go back again to this idea of being blameless. It does not mean sinless. It's not what it means. The idea of being blameless means that you are growing in grace and truth, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and when you fail, you are faithful to deal with it. You go before the Lord, you confess it, you don't only confess it, you correct it, and you pick up in the power of the Spirit, and you keep pressing on. That's what God wants our life to look like. Verse 24, he just gave us a command to do stuff, and then he says, he who calls you is faithful, he will do it. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about working out what God has worked in. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it is God who's at work within you. He is faithful. He'll do it. Just let him do it. And then he says, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I told someone a while back when I went to Ukraine, we found out that in Ukraine, the churches, the men greet each other with a kiss. Yeah. On the lips. Oh, yeah. Been there, done that, don't like it. But this was a custom in those days. Sometimes it was on the lips, sometimes it was on the cheek, but it was, it was simply the custom at that time. We could greet each other with a holy handshake or hug. We'll put it that way. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Thus concludes a whole book in a Friday night and Saturday. And again, granted, we could take a lot more time, go into a lot more depth. My, my goal in this was to just clarify the issue of the rapture. What's it going to be like? How is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Can we ascertain from Scripture that the rapture of the church will come before 
the tribulation period? Well, I'm glad you asked. Go with me back to the appendices to chapter or to page 13. And some of you may have already looked over this. But these are evidences that the rapture must precede the tribulation. I certainly don't have enough time here to go through all of these. Daniel's 70th week in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 demands that the church age fit before verse, between verse 26 and 27. Secondly, Jesus' outline in Matthew 24. He gives us a very clear outline. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. Then there will be great tribulation. Then you'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming. No reference to the church there. The format of the book of Revelation. In the first three chapters of Revelation, the church is mentioned 19 times. In chapter 4 and 5, we see the church in heaven. How do we know it's the church? Because they're all singing a song and they're saying, You made us to be kings and priests. What believers from what age are referred to in the Bible as kings and priests? Only church age believers. Then from chapter 6 to chapter 19, there is no reference to the church. Just take the outline the way John wrote it. It tells us that the church cannot be in the tribulation. Point four, we just saw Paul's distinction between two days, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Point five, the comfort to the Thessalonians. This is coming up tomorrow in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The church as a mystery that demands that the mystery be removed before the age of Israel resumes. Paul's prophecy of Israel's restoration in Romans 11.25 says that hardening in part has happened to Israel until, that's a time limitation, until what? The fullness of the Gentiles comes in. What is that? That's the rapture of the church. Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 in Luke 4, 8 to 19, and he stops in the middle of a sentence. Why? Because that's where the church age begins, and he wasn't ready to get into that. Everything's done for a reason. Jesus promised in John 14 and verse 3, I am coming again to receive you to myself. That's speaking of the rapture of the church. And 10th, the mystery of the resurrection of the church age in 1 Corinthians 15 very clearly tells us that we are going to be raptured before the tribulation period. In Appendix D, there are some reasons given. This is by Dr. Johnson, who has documented that many of the apostolic fathers use these terms to speak of and teach the rapture of the church. You have probably heard people tell you this. Well, the doctrine of the rapture only came around about the end of the 1800s. Baloney. First of all, it was taught by the Apostle Paul, but Dr. Johnson, if you, if you get his book, I think it's called The Apostolic Fathers, he shows you what the early church believed. These were the men who learned directly from the apostles, what they call the apostolic fathers, or they learned from someone that learned directly from one of the early apostles. And you know the amazing thing? Right down the line, they believed what we believe. Right down the line. And so they use terms like this. There are 17 of them. You see the work that I put in for you? Blood, sweat, and tears. I'm talking hours and hours of work. Some called it the appearing, Hebrews 9.28. Some called it the blessed hope, Titus 2.13. Some called it the catching up, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Some called it the changing, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Some called it the gathering, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Some called it the manifestation of the sons of God, Romans 8, 18 to 25. Some called it the mercy, Jude 21. Some called it the receiving, John 14, 3. Some called it the redemption of our bodies, Romans 8, 18 to 25. Some called it the rescue or deliverance, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 and 5, 10. Some called it the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 1 Peter 1, 13. Some called it the transformation, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Some called it the day of Christ, which I don't have verses uh, listed there because if you go back to page 6 on uh, under point 1, you'll have a whole list of verses. 
I just didn't do the extra work of bringing them over here. Page six under point one. Some called it the presence or the coming of Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 2.19 and 3.13. Some called it the removal of the restrainer, 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Some said it was the second appearance to the saints, Hebrews 9.28. Some said it was his coming in like manner, Acts 1.11. Do you think they taught what we taught? Is there any doubt that they believe what we believe? I really don't think so. You want a real, real quick illustration of other biblical examples of rapture look at appendix e enoch is a picture from genesis 5 and hebrews 11 elijah is a picture in second kings chapter 2 jesus is a picture in acts 1 9 through 11 in fact it even uses the same word caught up is the word harpazo philip's an example acts chapter 8 he was caught away guess what the word is harpazo the two witnesses in Revelation eleven twelve are taken up, and it's interesting that the command that they hear that brings them to life from the dead, come up here, is the same command given to John in Revelation. And I haven't even touched on all the verses. What you don't realize, you have a gold mine here. Look at this. 16 pages. And I have touched on a fraction of it. And what was it he was saying earlier? Let me see if I can. Back here in chapter 5, verse 20, or chapter 5, verse 12. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. I don't want your... Signs or evidences of affection. Not that I mind. Please don't misunderstand. Not that I mind. I want you to take this and digest it. I don't want my work to be for nothing. There are few, so very few, who take the pages of notes that I give them. I just gave out 25 pages of notes in Texas. If I had one or two people who would sit down and go through it and look up every verse, every one of them, and then jot a note out to the side. If you need something to remind you, jot a note out to the side. I told you about chapter 6, uh, under point 1, the day of the Lord refers to the tribulation day of Christ, designates the rapture of the church. Right there is that whole list of verses that I left out of the appendix that I just gave you. This is gold. Now, I'm not saying it's a great work because I did. I'm just saying it's taken time, effort, prayer, study, sleepless nights. You have no idea how many times I go to sleep and it's like the Spirit of God starts bugging me. You need to check this out. And I've learned if I don't get up and check it out, I'll forget it by the next morning. I have to get up and sometimes I think... I'm so tired. All right, I'll get up. You know, it's kind of grudging with the Holy Spirit. Not a good idea. All right, Spirit, okay, all right, okay. I'll get up because all I got to do is stumble to the kitchen and I'll jot down these verses in my mind and two hours later, Nan comes out and finds me sitting there still working away. Am I lying? If I'm lying, I'm dying. Make use of the notes. We're going to break. I'm over time, but that's okay. Next hour is question and answer. Let's pray. Thanks, Father, for your love, for your grace, for all your provision for us. Help us to be wise. Take advantage of all that you provide, we pray in Jesus' name. 